Hello, everyone. Welcome to Gardening Green Expo 2024. The sponsors of the expo are the NSRWA, the WaterSmart Program, and Kennedy's Country Gardens. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we will have a Q&A session after the presentation is done. And if you have a question to ask, you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little icon that says chat. You just type your question in there and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. So now I would like to present Doug Tallamy. Wow, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> This is a brand new talk. So you are either a lucky audience or a an unfortunate audience because I've never given it to anybody yet. So um, we'll see how it goes. I call it, you know, I know you're very busy, but that's the title of um, endless emails that I get, people asking me questions uh, that I, I answer. <clears throat> so before we start with those questions, let me just remind you that we are evolutionary guests on this planet and our stay here is provisional. If we destroy our life support systems, our residency on the planet is going to be a short one. Now, because every person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems, every person bears responsibility for taking care of those ecosystems. Now, fortunately, more and more people are, are understanding this message and accepting the responsibility. Uh, but that means they need a lot more knowledge to actually act on it. Uh, and I, for some reason that people think that I can give them some of that knowledge. So many of them are, are asking me for it. And Albert Einstein is guilting me into actually answering those emails. He says, those who have privilege, the privilege to know have the duty to act. So that's what this talk's all about. Um, the people are asking me questions, have heard my talks, they have read my books, and they still have very good questions. So uh, that is going to be the topic of my, my next book. It'll be out in March of next year. It's about 400 of those questions. We're going to talk about 25 of them tonight, um, but it'll it'll get us started anyway. And one question I get uh, quite a bit is, is how I got interested in conservation. Uh, and that actually started very on. First of all, I was born loving nature, so I was attracted to it wherever I saw it. Uh, but when I was in third grade, we moved to a new development called Oak Park in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. And it was called Oak Park because oaks are what they took down to create the, the development. Well, they we lived in a circle and they built the houses from right to left. So our house was the first house to be built on the circle. That means the lot to the left of us was the last house to be built. And it was undeveloped for a full year after we moved in. And there was a little pond just like this on that lot. So that was my first real exposure to nature. I spent a lot of time at that pond. In the spring, toads came and sang. I thought that was really cool. Uh, and then the males hugged the females. That was that was cool too. And then of course the the uh, females laid eggs and the males fertilized those eggs. And that got the whole thing started because those eggs turned into polywogs, uh, which after a couple of weeks in the water developed into little toads. And just before they come out, they've got a little bit of, of tail um, that's shortening rapidly and they use that to, to uh, spur their growth. But they are tiny little things. I mean, he looks big now, but when you put him on your hand, it is a tiny little guy. Uh, and that is what was escaping from the pond uh, one day when I was sitting there watching. All the toads came coming out, thousands of them, but it was the same time that the bulldozer came and buried the whole pond. Buried the toads. It would have buried me too. I don't think he even saw me, but I did run away. But it made an impression on me that uh, we needed to save nature uh, as many places as we could. Now, I could have just walked right back into my backyard, gotten a shovel, and dug a new pond. I bet you my parents would have helped me do it. But it never occurred to me to do that. Um, you know, it was the standard idea of conservation. We've got to save nature before people destroy it. We've got to go to pristine areas and save it. Restoring nature after it's been destroyed just did not occur to me. And I'm, I'm sorry that it did not. But it, it set me on the, on the path of, of conservation. I've been conservation-minded ever since that happened in third grade. Another question, why can't insects quickly adapt to non-native plants? I get this one quite a bit, uh, and it's a good question. 
because people will correctly point out that insects have the ability to adapt to, to uh, lots of things very quickly, particularly insecticides. Insecticide resistance is a big problem in agriculture. Uh, well, this is, this is how insecticide resistance happens. When you spray a field, for example, uh, there are always a couple of, let's say these are moths, there's a couple of moths that are going to have resistant genes uh, in them already. So the spray will kill all the moths in the field except the few that have resistant genes. Those are the ones that will mate and create a new generation, and there'll be a whole lot more resistant genes in that generation. Then the next generation after another round of spraying will be even more resistance, and finally everybody will be resistant. And that happened in just four generations, very, very fast. Well, why doesn't that happen when uh, a, a new host plant uh, appears? Why aren't the insects adapting to that? The simple answer is it's far more complicated. You have to think about what it takes for an insect to recognize and use a new host plant. Um, insects do this primarily through uh, chemical signals. So for example, when a butterfly lands on a leaf, uh, it has to decide, is this an appropriate host plant? And it does that, first of all, it finds the plant with sensors on its antennae. Um, and then it, it evaluates the plant once it's landed on it with sensors on its tarsi, on its feet. So it's smelling the plant uh, in the air with, with its antennae, and it's smelling the uh, hydrocarbons that are on the leaf, the waxy coating of the leaf, to determine whether it's the right species. Um, before it actually uh, lays an egg, um, there, there, of course, there are those receptors on the antennae, there are also receptors on, on the ovipositor at the end of the abdomen. And in order to, to actually lay an egg on this new plant, you'd require a mutation in the genes uh, controlling those antennal receptions, in the, the genes controlling the tarsal receptors, and finally in the genes controlling the, um, well, there are the tarsal receptors, the ovipositor receptors. So there's, there's three forms of confirmation to make sure that that butterfly is on the right plant. Once it lays its egg, of course, the, the little guy hatches out. Its very first meal is the uh, eggshell itself because uh, it's full of protein. But then they have to deal with this, this plant. Now, if they're on their correct host plant, there's no problem. They recognize it as food. They can eat it. They are physiologically adapted to it. But if it's a new novel host plant, one they've never seen before in evolutionary time, um, they're going to have to have adaptations that detoxify the chemical defenses of this plant uh, and also that signal that it is the correct plant to start eating. So just to summarize, you've got to have a whole lot of simultaneous adaptations to allow a, uh, an insect to switch hosts. It's got to be able to detect that plant among an array of, of hundreds of other species. That happens mostly with the antennae. Then it's got to accept the chem chemical signals of the, the uh, lax Wax is on the leaf itself with its tarsi uh, and also its ovipositor. Um, the hatchling has to accept the new taste of the plant, and it also has to be able to physiologically detoxify the plant's defensive chemistry. So host switches happen, but not very often. It's very hard to get all those things to line up at the same time. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. It, of course, is, is uh, adapted to milkweeds. Well, Black swallowwort is a plant in the milkweed lineage. It's not in the same genus, but it is closely enough related to milkweeds that it gives off chemical signals that monarchs detect mistakenly as milkweeds. Uh, so they actually land on the plant. The chemical signals are, are still consistent with milkweeds, and occasionally they will lay an egg on it. <clears throat> and that's where the system falls apart because the, the young Monarch butterfly is unable to detoxify the compounds that are in black swallow part. So we introduced as an ornamental back in 1854, that's 170 years ago. Uh, the monarch is still unable to use it as a host plant. The final, final bit of adaptations required uh, to make that a host switch have not occurred yet. Okay, question three. You claim it takes thousands of years for insects to adapt to new hosts, host plants. But some other entomologists disagree and point to several species of butterflies that now breed successfully on non-native plants. How do you explain that? Uh, well, that's another good question. There are two ways that insects adapt new host plants. Host switching, and that's what we just talked about, very hard, very difficult for that to happen. 
or host range expansion. That's not hard. And the reason it's not hard uh, is, is because um, insects already have the adaptations required to use a new host in host range expansion. So when I say it takes eons to adapt to a new host, I'm talking about host switching, not host range expansion. Most of the cases of native insects reproducing on non-native plants are examples of host range expansion. So um, the big deal, the big difference here is that host range expansion does not require any new adaptations. The insect already has all of the adaptations required to use this new host plant. Typically, the new host plant is in the same lineage as the host that the insect is, ad is already adapted to which is why it doesn't need any new adaptations to use it. The black swallowtail is a very common example. Um, it, of course, is a specialist on plants in the carrot family. It can eat all of them. Uh, so when we import Queen Anne's lace, carrots, or dill, or parsley, black swallowtails already have the adaptations necessary to use those plants. If we simply compare the uh, go to the literature and look at host records and compare the number of, of caterpillars, lepidopteran species that are using native plants versus non-native plants. And this data it said is from woody plants in the mid-Atlantic state. Uh, but it shows that, that um, when you have a non-native plant, there's a 90% reduction in the ability of, of our insects to be able to use them. So even with host range expansion, um, very few insects are able to use these non-native plants, even when they're in the same lineage. Question four, what is carrying capacity? I use that term in my talks quite often, but I don't usually explain what it is. Um, well, it's the number of individuals of a particular species that can be supported sustainably. Sustainably means kind of forever without degrading the resource base. In other words, that individual can, can uh, thrive in this uh, habitat without causing other species to decline because it's not using up its resource base. What is the resource base? Well, carrying capacity for animals comes from plants because it's plants that is capturing energy. They're capturing energy from the sun, uh, combining it with carbon dioxide from the air, water from the ground, and through uh, you know the miraculous uh, phytochemistry we call photosynthesis, it produces oxygen. And now the energy from the sun is tied up in the, the carbon bonds of simple sugars and carbohydrates, which is the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet. So plants are making the food. They are the, the, um, they are the species that are determining what the carrying capacity for animals are. A useful analogy might be um, comparing carrying capacity to our, our bank accounts, our savings accounts. The amount of plant life in an ecosystem could be considered the principle of an ecological bank account. Uh, now that principle is going to generate interest. So the energy fixed by those plants is going to be the interest created by our ecological bank account. And that is what plant or, or animal life is going to, to uh, live off of if you remain below the carrying capacity. So an animal population can grow and cycle beneath the carrying capacity uh, essentially forever because they're never reducing the principal in the bank account. The bank account is producing the energy that these, these animals use uh, and it can go on happily forever. But what if you exceed the carrying capacity or some, something else reduces the principal in your, your bank account? Well, then of course it's going to produce far less interest and any animal population will have to be there in far fewer numbers. Um, so that in a nutshell is what carrying capacity is. Question five, I live in an area with lots of Lyme disease. Several websites suggest keeping large lawns because they're not attractive to ticks. The sites also say I should get rid of brush piles because ticks love them. How can I contribute to local ecosystems without getting Lyme disease? Another good question. Well, let's think about what deer ticks actually need to survive in our landscapes. Deer ticks do not eat native plants. They do not eat leaf litter. They do not eat brush piles. They eat blood. So what they need is mammal hosts. They also need high humidity, and that's why plant life and brush life uh, is, is a good place for them to hide. Well, the mammal blood that they're eating, as the typical mammals in our landscapes, are white-tailed deer. They are an essential part of the Lyme disease uh, black-legged tick or deer tick life cycle. And uh, another other major feature of that life cycle is typically uh, white-footed mice 
Uh, there are other mammals that can serve that way too. Uh, so some people say, well, we should get rid of all the mice and that'll break the, the cycle. But white-footed mice and other, other rodents in our ecosystems are essential components of terrestrial ecosystems. If we got rid of our small, small mammals, we get rid of all of our hawks and our owls and, and uh, our, our you know, black snakes, all the other things that, that depend on them. The problem is right here. We have way too many uh, deer. Uh, and that is why Lyme disease has become a real problem. When I was growing up, of course, uh, there were very few deer where there was no Lyme disease. I never saw a deer tick and we ran in the web, around the woods all the time. Um, so now with an overabundance of deer, we've got a problem. How can we control deer? I'm not going to dwell on this. This is, of course, very controversial. You can put predators back. You can hire sharpshooters to reduce the deer in your, in your uh, neighborhood. Uh, it's very expensive. They'll get about a third of them, and then they'll increase right away, so they have to keep coming back, and people don't usually do that. Bern Blasi at Cornell is suggesting we, we change the rules and start market hunting again. Look at how well it got rid of those pesky bison and the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet and all the other things. Market hunting really does work, uh, but we need to change our, our hunting rules. Uh, but without doing that, there's a good way to reduce the infectivity rates on your property. What you want to do is increase alternate hosts for those ticks, because many of those hosts are dead end hosts. The Lyme, uh, the Borrelia, the disease itself cannot replicate in many of those small mammal hosts. So if we increase the population of alternate hosts, things like skunks and, and uh, chipmunks and coons, uh, that's a possum, that's a coon, foxes, all of these things on our property, uh, most of them are dead end hosts. And it the chances of you running into a tick that actually has uh, a high load of, of uh, the disease uh, are greatly reduced. So for here's a good example. In the south, southeast, um, there are a lot of deer and there are a lot of deer ticks, but there's very little Lyme disease in humans. Why? Because there's also a lot of lizards, things like the blue-tailed skink and uh, anoles, uh, a number of these things. And these guys are dead-end hosts. So the ticks get on, on these vertebrates um, and they are siphoned off. The, the uh, percentage of ticks that are actually carrying um, viable uh, disease loads is, is greatly reduced. And by the way, ticks don't run after you. They, they do something we call questing. They crawl to the top of a, a, a little piece of vegetation and they put their little legs out. And when you walk by, they, they grab on. So design a landscape where you can walk in uh, your yard without brushing up against uh, vegetation. Uh, this is a perfect use of lawn, by the way. I talk all the time about reducing the area of lawn. Uh, well, it's still very functional. It's the best place to walk. It's a cue for care. This is a very attractive landscape. It's got a lot of other plants in it. Um, so particularly during the high, the months of high infectivity, which are May and June, it's a good idea to stay on the, the uh, mowed areas of your, your yard and not venture into these places. Um, and then, you know, later on in the year, infectivity levels drop and you can do that. So swaths of grass is a good idea. You don't need acres of it, though. Question six, plants and animals have always moved around the planet. So the arrival of new species on our shores is a natural process. So what's the big deal? If a new species, if the new species are more fit than the species are already here, then they deserve to replace them. Well, there's a lot of misconceptions in this, this question. First of all, plants and animals have always moved around the planet, yes, but at a very sl slow rate. Um, the rate at which we're moving plants and animals now uh, is, is thousands, probably millions of times faster than what happened in, in the evolutionary, evolutionary past. Um, so yes, movement is normal, but the rates of movement that we are moving uh, plants and animals around is not normal. What's the big deal if they are more fit? Well, are they more fit? Um, you know, that's been that's been the party line is that, well, these guys are highly competitive. This is a White Clay Creek State Park uh, near me. And every bit of green you're looking at is an invasive plant from Asia. These are all escapees from our gardens. About 30% of the vegetation, excuse me, in this state park uh, are now invasive species. I took this picture in March when uh, plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So you can see it is a huge load. And you might conclude, well, they're displacing our native plants, so they are much more fit. 
But back to those deer, they're not more fit. It's just that the deer don't like them. The deer like our native plants, just like our insects like our native plants. So uh, they eat the young oaks and the cherries and all the other things that we ought to have in our, our landscapes. And they don't eat the autumn olive and the, and the bush honeysuckle and the, the uh, barberry and the burning bush and all the other invasives that are out there. So, uh, so of course, that's all that's left. It's not that they're more fit. It's that the deer are pushing, tipping the competitive balance against our native plants. So another reason to reduce the number of deer in our landscapes. Uh, this, by the way, is my front yard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think there's an eighth one back there. We got a lot of deer, so I, I get it. I went to the Great Smoky Mountains in uh, spring of last year, uh, and this is what the the understory looked like. Uh, and you know, I hadn't seen an understory like this in in a long time. So I asked the the uh, guide I was with, uh, "How do you control your deer?" And he said, we don't control our deer. I said, well, how can you possibly have an understory like this if you don't control your deer? He said, well, we have black bears, we've got bobcats, and we've got coyotes. Uh, they control our deer. Uh, so that's an example of putting the predators back. Now, they don't have any wolves, but it's enough to uh, have a, a healthy forest like this. Most of these plants here are young trees of the, what will become the canopy tree. So if a tree falls over, you've got young canopy trees to replace them. Um, this is a picture from my yard. Uh, we have no understory. The deer have destroyed it. This is all Japanese stilt grass. It's the only thing the deer don't eat. Um, these, you know, when these trees mature and die, there's nothing to, to replace them unless I actively plant them and protect them from the deer. So overbrowsing by deer inhibits uh, recruitment into our forest, uh, and it's another huge problem. Okay, question seven. What about the risks of bringing nature into our everyday spaces? Isn't interacting with nature dangerous? Well, our ability to assess risk is really poor. Here are some of the actual danger points we have in our lives. Um, so West Nile virus, uh, it's real. 130 people killed per year throughout the entire country. Only two are killed by snake bites. Alcohol kills 75,000 people. Melanoma, in other words, sunbathing. Almost 8,000 deaths per year, 76,000 new cases per year. So this is this is increasing. Car crashes kill 44,000 people. Um, child overheating in cars, 550 deaths uh, a year. Dogs are killing, you know, our man's best friend, killing 20 to 30 of us every year. Falling, 20,000 a year. Overdose is the big one. Um, you know, drug problems, 100 and almost 110,000 deaths per year. Texting kills over 3,000 people per year. Autoerotic asphyxiation, 600 deaths per year. Hot dogs, killing 70 people a year. Lightning kills 51. High school football kills 20. Vending machines falling over on us kills 13. Toasters, we put our forks in the toasters, 370 deaths per year. Flat screen TVs falling off the wall kills 41 of us. Selfies, 379 people killed by selfies. Can you guess how many people were killed by native plant gardening last year? I'll leave that one to you to figure out. Question eight, should we kill invasive species? Do we have the ethical right to decide what plant lives or dies? Okay, now we get into ethics. You know, it'd be hard to find someone who did not believe that humans are superior beings and therefore we are more important than any other species. So if there's a conflict, we're going to win. Um, that's that's pretty standard thinking, but I can guarantee you lions feel the same way. So do weevils, so do uh, dung beetles, so do rattlesnakes. Every creature on the planet feels like it has the the uh, the moral uh, right to to um, be here, even if it conflicts with somebody else. The reality is, even those who question our inherent right to manage invasive species make decisions about what lives and what dies every single day. We just don't think about it. Every time you select a non-native species over a native plant, you're deciding whether the chickadee in your yard is gonna be able to feed its babies or watch them starve to death because there aren't enough caterpillars. This is crepe myrtle, not making any caterpillars. If we maintain acres of lawn, we're deciding whether or not hundreds of species of native plants and thousands of the animals that depend on those plants are gonna be able to live in this space. 
Every time we hire a mosquito fogger, we're sentencing not just a few mosquitoes, but monarchs, all the pollinators, caterpillars, the bird food, we're sentencing them to death. And we're not controlling the mosquitoes when we do that. So by not controlling invasives, we're condemning entire food webs to death. Um, so we have to make that decision. You have to decide which, which is, is better. Um, but in, in either case, uh, things are going to die. Question nine, why do you only focus on moths? Aren't butterflies important too? Well, butterflies are beautiful and, and of course they're important, but moths are more important. Butterflies are bad tasting day flying moths. Uh, they, their, their phylogeny comes right out in the middle of moths. Uh, and because they don't taste very good, um, they're not contributing a lot to local food webs. For every species of butterfly that's out there, there are 19 species of moths, and that is what's running our, our food web. So I focus on them because they're ecologically so important. They are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Uh, and that's why Dan Jansen calls uh, moths the meat and potatoes of terrestrial food webs. They're essential. But I like them because they're also very cool. Uh, we've got gorgeous ones like the, the Madagascar moon moth. We've got moths that look like a rhinoceros. That's a brown rhinoceros. That's a yellow one. We've got moths that look like fish. I have not photoshopped any of these guys, by the way. Moths that look like algae, moths that look like rocket ships. We've got moths that look like stealth bombers, moths that look like lichens, a lot like lichens, moths that look like bird poop. We've got moths that look like the flowers that they eat. When I say moths, we're talking about the caterpillars of those moths. Or they look like the pine needles that they eat. There's a caterpillar there and a caterpillar there. They blend in really well. We've got moths that look like leaves, and we've got moths that really look like leaves. This is a species from Japan. It is on my bucket list. We've got moths that look like the seed heads that they're eating. There's a caterpillar wound up in there. You would never see that. We've got moths that look like seeds. We've got moths that look like sticks. We've got well, caterpillars that look like sticks, and we've got adult moths that look like sticks. Actually, quite a few species of them. Uh, most of the sphinx moths look like uh, jet planes. We've got moths that look like clowns. We've got big moths. We've got tiny moths. That's a pinhead there, and that's uh, one of the moths on my property. We've got beautiful moths and we've got dull moths. We've got moths that, that are startling in their effect when they spread their wings. We've got two-headed moths. And I've told that to people and they believe me, that's actually a male and a female mating, but uh, moths that are cryptic blending in very well. Uh, we got moths that blow up their prothorax and look an awful lot like snakes. This is actually a sphinx moth. These are the legs down here. He turns upside down. Uh, it's incredible mimicry. More member we have got moths that look like yellow jackets, moths that look like beetles, moths that look like jewels, and we've got moths, moths that look like that. So who wouldn't want to study moths? Do honeybees compete with native bees? I get this question a lot these days, and you know, I wish I didn't because um, bee peak Beekeeping is essential for uh, a number of, of forms of our agriculture, and it's a great hobby too. Uh, we've got a lot of lot of enthusiasts keeping bees, uh, but let's look at the numbers. We've got to, we're scientists. We've got to look at the numbers here. Honeybees are extreme generalists. A single honeybee hive can house up to thirty thousand bees. So there's a lot of bees in a single hive. Now honeybees can forage two miles from their hive, so they're covering a huge area. That means a single hive could potentially compete with native bees over 8,000 acres of land. Also, beekeepers supplement their hives with sugar uh, so that even when, when flower density is very low, the populations of honeybees are very high. As of April 2022, there were 2.92 million hives in the U.S., which means honeybees have saturated the area of continental U.S. 11.5 times. Now, let's assume native bee populations are near their carrying capacity. In other words, the, the populations are at the size that the, the, the environment can support. You cannot add 30,000 bees per hive to an area like that. It's already saturated with native bee uh, abundance without degrading the resources for those bees. So it's a sad fact, uh, but it's one that we need to think about because we've got almost 4,000 species of native bees and they are all in decline. Another question, privet flowers are good sources of honey and pollen for honeybees. 
if we remove privet, privet is invasive species, of course, from our natural areas as part of our fight against those invasive species, won't honeybees suffer? Um, privets, actually, we've got nine species of privet in, in the U.S. They are all highly invasive. Uh, in Alabama alone, one species, the Chinese privet, covers a million acres. So they are everywhere. And when they cover an area, they push out the native plants. Well, privet blooms for about a week. So my question is, what are honeybees and all the other native bee species that need forage going to use for forage? By forage, I mean those flowering plants. What are they going to use for forage the other 51 weeks of the year? Because remember, the, the privet has pushed out the other flowering plants that would support both, both the honeybee and our, our native bees. Uh, and that's why I say that, that uh, privet is not good for honeybees, and removing it will only help our, our bee populations. Question 12, oaks are dying right and left. Yes, they are. And as we cut them down, should we leave the logs on our property or, or to prevent per infection of other trees, or can we can, um, leave them as, as coarse woody debris? It's another good question. Um, the answer is you can leave them. Uh, so the diseases that we have, things like bacterial leaf scorch, this is bacterial leaf scorch, we've got oak wilt, we've got sudden oak death syndrome, um, those diseases are spread when the tree is still alive. The spores of the, the disease are active as it's killing the tree. They do not remain in dead wood. So downed wood, it's called coarse woody debris, uh, is a very valuable habitat, and we should leave as much of it as we can. You know, we're, we're neat nicks. So we'd like to clean up our forests and get rid of all this stuff, but so many things depend on this downed wood. Um, so if you pull apart a, a log um, any time of the year, even in the wintertime, it's going to be filled with, with columbula, like this little sminthurid, uh, or centipedes, not or, and centipedes, and millipedes, and uh, the larvae of click beetles. They all live in dead logs. The larvae of fire color beetles, many beetle larvae live in dead logs, including a number of species of scarabs. They develop in, in uh, coarse woody debris. So do cerambicid longhorn beetles. Uh, and and when you, if anybody splits wood, uh, you run into their larvae. They're called flat-headed borers. They're very common uh, in our, our downed logs. Leucanid stag beetles, and some of these species are, are endangered at this point, uh, live in downed logs. Basalid best beetles have social uh, structures in our downed logs. Buprested wood, uh, metallic wood boring beetles live in those logs. Several species of butterflies overwinter as adults in coarse woody debris that's on the ground. Things like morning cloaks and commas and question marks all live in spaces like that. And then, of course, we have our carpenter bees. We've got large carpenter bees and we've got small species of carpenter bees there in that wood. You know, when we clean up all the coarse woody debris, where are the carpenter bees going to go? They're going to go to uh, the soffits on our house, they're going to go to our porch railings and then people get upset. So keep some of that, that coarse woody debris around and they will breed in that. And then we have ants, carpenter ants. Carpenter ants don't eat wood. They hollow out uh, wood that's been damaged uh, or is rotting and they, they live uh, within that. Uh, and then they often forage in your house. You think you've got them uh, living in your house, but they're usually living in a tree uh, or a, a dead snag in your backyard. And it's a good thing we have carpenter ants because we wouldn't have pileated woodpeckers if we didn't. Pileated woodpeckers feed their young carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers if you don't have any carpenter ants. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have those downed trees that support them. Question 13, what's the best way to plant and propagate milkweed? Well, unfortunately, milkweed seeds, uh, that's the worst way to propagate milkweed. Uh, they make a lot of seeds. It's easy to gather, easy to gather them up, but many of them are infertile. Uh, it's often up to 90% of them are infertile. So uh, you get, you're disappointed at the rate of germination for uh, a lot of these milkweed species. The very best way is to dig up a, an existing milkweed plant and divide the stoloniferous root system. So what they do is they grow laterally underground and then they send up ramets. That's why when you look at a milkweed patch, it can actually be a single plant that has gone out in all different directions. Cut this, this uh, 
uh, lateral root, this this um, stoloniferous root into maybe two inch sections, plant it about an, an inch under the surface of the soil, and it will germinate or generate a, a new plant, a new rabbit. Uh, and it's fast. It's a very easy way to do it. I discovered uh, this by accident. I had some milkweed growing up in my vegetable garden, and this was back in the days when I actually used a rototiller. So I rototilled the whole thing, meaning I chopped up these roots into many tiny pieces. So I took was what was about three milkweed plants and turned it into about 50 milkweed plants just by doing that. Speaking of monarchs, is rearing monarchs good or bad? Well, it depends on your intentions and how you're doing it. There are really two reasons that people rear monarchs. They rear them for fun and for educational purposes or for conservation. So when you rear them for educational purposes, um, there's a number of lessons that you can, you can impart. You can teach kids about the different insect life stages, what complete metamorphosis is, egg, larva, pupa, and a, an adult. You can teach them about host plant specialization. You're not going to have monarchs if you don't have, have the one thing that they eat, and that is milkweeds. These are valuable lessons. So actually, I, I support that. Rearing for conservation is a different issue. Uh, then you're rearing as many monarchs as you can. Uh, and two problems here. First of all, when you crowd them, it's, it's very easy for them to uh, pass diseases back and forth. Uh, and also, you're removing them from natural selection in the field. What you're selecting for here are monarchs that are good at surviving in a crowded situation like this in containers. Uh, but they're removed from the pressures that they have to experience in, in the field. Um, and, and that, of course, is not, not going to be good. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. The disease transmission and, and removing them from, from natural selection. If you really want to help monarchs, the best way is to provide what they need, and that is milkweed. That is large patches of milkweed, not one or two ramets here or there, but a whole patch. Um, and a patch like this will support as many monarchs as you have. Believe me, they're never going to be able to defoliate it. So this is the best way if you're really into monarch conservation. Question 14, the monarchs on my milkweed keep disappearing. Just when they get big, they disappear. I get this question about, about the black swallowtails, about a number of different butterflies. Now, I assume the birds are eating them, but I thought the monarch cat caterpillars tasted bad, so I'm confused. What is stealing my monarchs? Uh, well, the answer is nothing stealing your monarchs. Butterflies pupate typically off of their host plant. So here's a, a monarch chrysalis, and it's attached to a, a blade of grass. This is from my, my yard. It's not attached to a milkweed plant. I have never found a chrysalis on a milkweed plant. And the reason is they want to get away from the plant because their natural enemies find the chrysalis by finding the milkweed plant. They're attracted to the plant first and they look all around to see if there's any monarchs there. So monarchs and other, other butterflies, moths, lots of things will leave their host plant before they pupate, before they, before they form their chrysalis and do it someplace else. This is the pipe vine swallowtail again on, on uh, it's my, I think this is goldenrod, but it's not on uh, pipe vine. As a matter of fact, we, we have a sliding glass door that leads out to our back where the pipe vine is. And um, I found a pipe vine chrysalis, pipe vine swallowtail chrysalis hanging from one of our picture frames on the wall in our house. That little guy had crawled all the way up our stairs into our house and, and formed its chrysalis on our, our window. So it, it's getting away from its host plant so that it's not attacked by its natural enemies. So again, bottom line is nothing's taking your monarchs. They're simply forming a chrysalis someplace where you're not looking for them. Question 15. What are those orange and black bugs on my milkweed? Should I kill them? You know, I, <laughs> I get this all the time. Why is our default uh, option to kill them right away? But I would say, should I leave them alone? Yes, leave them alone. Uh, you've got several things that are eating eating uh, milkweed, and most of them are orange and black. Milkweed, remember, is a toxic plant. It tastes bad. So if you can eat milkweed, you taste bad, and it's a good idea to advertise that uh, in what we call aposematic coloration. Orange and black is a universal aposematic coloration. Um, birds that eat insects, mammals that eat insects know that, uh, and they don't. they won't eat something that's orange and black. So this is the large milkweed bug, Oncopeltis fasciatus. It can be common on our milkweeds once they reach the stage where they form uh, their, their pods, because these guys are seed eaters. 
They're only eating the seeds. They don't eat the plants. These are adults, of course. Uh, these are nymphs of the same species, and they're eating seeds as well. The seeds are lined up inside this pond. So these guys push their mouth parts through the pod and um, suck on the seed that's in the pod. Uh, so there's two reasons that they're doing this gregariously, and by gregariously, I mean um, together. Uh, one is that it forms uh, at what we call an episomatic warning signal that's very noticeable. When you're all grouped together, it sends this, this message, we taste bad. Uh, it's easier to see, so it's easier for predators to avoid them. But feeding facilitation is also one of the reasons they're, feed, they're, they're all gathered up together like this. Uh, remember, these guys have sucking mouth parts, and they're eating a solid. How do they do that? They can't suck the seed through their mouth part. Well, what they do is, is they digest it externally. So they actually spit on the seed uh, and digest it outside of their body, and then they suck up the, the, uh, all the material that's, that's left. And when you do that uh, as an aggregation like this, you're able to digest a lot more seeds, uh, and, and it's easier for each individual to be able to eat um, when you're grouped up like this. That's called feeding facilitation. But people get upset, oh, it's going to kill all my milkweed seeds. No, they only get the very first layer of seeds that are in this pod. And if you've ever looked in a milkweed pod, there's layer and layer and layer. Uh, of seeds out there. So it's, they're, they're part of the, the natural fauna that's associated with milkweeds. And by the way, these guys display the exact same migration pattern that monarchs do. They don't go to Mexico, but they do fly south in the, in the uh, fall, um, all the way down to the Gulf, Gulf states. And that's where they overwinter uh, because there are milkweeds making pods down in the, in the Gulf states. And then they fly back up in the springtime. The other species that's black and, and uh, orange that's very common on milkweeds is the milkweed tussock moth. Uh, and they can be there in, in big aggregations. It's how they overcome the sticky latex sap. So when they're young, uh, they're not black and orange, uh, but as they get older, they turn black and orange and they always feed together. They're actually uh, quite beautiful uh, creatures, uh, but people worry, well, they're gonna, they're gonna kill my milkweed. You know, they, they do get numerous and they can strip uh, two or three of your milkweed ramets. Uh, but don't worry, it's got that underground root system. Uh, it's not going to kill it. They will come back. This is what the adult looks like. Uh, it's a drab moth. Uh, you're not likely to notice it at all. Question 16, could you provide your thoughts on the use of southern, more heat tolerant species within our more northern parts of the U.S.? Uh, so we're talking about assisted migration with climate change. Should we be moving plants up from the south? Uh, I'm not a fan of assisted migration, uh, and this is why. This is the jet stream. And in the old days, before climate change, it was much better behaved. It would dip here and there, but uh, you didn't have wild dips. And above the jet stream, it was usually pretty cold. And below the jet stream, it was more mild, particularly in the wintertime. Under uh, the climate change scenario, though, you get these wild swings of the jet stream. Uh, so you get unusual heat, even in the northern areas when it's uh, way up here. But when it dips down, then this becomes really cold. So it can dip down all the way into to Mexico. You remember the big freezes that went right through Texas a couple of years ago? Killed even many of our native plants down here uh, because it, it got unusually cold. So this is a feature of climate change. Uh, we don't have a gentle warming. We've got wild swings in temperatures <clears throat> that average out to be warmer over the, the long run, but we still have cold snaps. So if you bring plants up from the south, many of them aren't going to make it. Another reason I, I'm not a fan of assisted migration is that we don't want to move plants out of their native range because then you're disassociating them with the animals that they co-evolved with. Remember, our plants are supporting the, the local food web. Uh, and if you remove them from that food web, uh, the wherever you take them to, those, those animals are probably not adapted to using those plants, which means they become, they become decorations, just like a plant from, from Asia. <clears throat> Question 17, what do you think of no mo may? Uh, well, not much. It's, it's a good intention, but ecologically, it's a bad idea. When you don't mow turf grass, you get tall turf grass. That's exactly what happened in this house. They had a perfect lawn, 
Uh, and then I guess they went into foreclosure and the people just moved out. Nobody took care of it. So it got long. But tall turf grass doesn't support pollinators any better than, than short uh, turf grass does. And if you have uh, uh, an ugly lawn that's full of dandelions and, and clover and other things, uh, then it will. If you don't mow it, yes, it will support pollinators for the month of May. But then I presume you're going to mow it in June. So what? It's it's like bait and switch. You call the pollinators in, and then in June you remove all the resources that they they need. Pollinators don't live for just a month, uh, so it, it's much better to have no mow areas that you never mow. Create a pollinator garden, an attractive one like this, where you've got uh, a number of different flowering plants that are going to bloom uh, on a sequence from April all the way through the end of October. <clears throat> That's a, it's a real challenge to make a garden like this, but that is what the pollinators mean, not just one month of, of not mowing your grass. How should I remove lawn? So let's say you want to create a pollinator garden like this and it's lawn right now. How can you remove that, that grass? Uh, well, what you have to do is kill the root systems of your turf grass. Uh, because turf grass is is a highly competitive plant. Uh, it is it is going to outcompete anything you you plant there. So you've got to kill the root systems. And there's a couple of ways to do that. What works would be to smother that turf grass. Uh, you can use black plastic. You can use cardboard. You can use builder's paper. And of course, the professionals use herbicide because they can't wait months to do this. What doesn't work is is digging up your yard and then flipping it over. Uh, and hoping that that kills the grass. Uh, it really won't. Uh, most of the root system will survive and, and it'll, it'll just start growing again. Or cutting it really short and seeding over it. Um, that doesn't work either. The grass is going to recover and it's going to outcompete anything you seed it in. Uh, and some people simply dig up all the grass and, and carry it away. But then you're removing a whole bunch of, of uh, um, topsoil as well. And you don't want to do that. You want to keep that topsoil, very valuable stuff. So here's black plastic spread out uh, over a pretty big area. This works, but it, it literally takes months to kill that, that grass. And you can't have any holes in here. You can't allow the, uh, the grass to get sunlight anywhere uh, because it will survive. <clears throat> this guy's using uh, cardboard. I've done this myself, uh, but notice you can even see it here. Cardboard always has uh, plastic tape on it. Uh, and in the one year I did this, I was pulling up tape uh, for about four or five years after that. So uh, I'm not a big fan of, of cardboard. Uh, this is builder's tape. It's a, it's a terrible web pictures of, of the gray builder's tape. But if you've ever been in a, a new new construction house, they've got this spread on the, on the floor. Uh, this is actually a really good idea. You put some mulch over the top of it, then you can plant right through it because it just dissolves. You never have to pull it up. Um, so you, you're going to smother the grass uh, but you can you can start planting um, a little bit sooner this way. It's also very cheap. Uh, if you decide to do herbs, use herbicides, you can use uh, you know a, an herbicide that kills everything, or you can use an herbicide that is grass specific. It fo it focuses only on grasses, and there's a lot of them. What do you think of Milwaukee forests? Uh, they're you know Milwaukee the Milwaukee method uh, is to uh, create what we call tiny forest. You, you take an area and you crowd plants, uh, really crowd, just like this into that area. It was designed by a Japanese man named Miyawaki uh, and for, for actually more tropical uh, settings where plants are very good at, at growing very densely. Uh, but we're using it in, in temperate zone situations now. Um, and often in urban areas. So there's a number of pluses here. Uh, look what's happening here. These, this, is, this is a community effort. You're actually getting people involved in conservation, working together, getting to know each other, usually taking degraded land and, and uh, making it somewhat productive wherever you create one of these Miyawaki forests. There are advantages and there are disadvantages. The advantage is you're going to plant small plants, which means costs are low. Uh, that's great. The tinier uh, the plant, the better. And you're going to plant them very densely, which means weeding is reduced. There's not going to be space for weeds to come in there. Because when you have a planting, typically um, invasive plants are trying to get in there right away. So it reduces weeding. It creates high plant diversity, which in theory should create high insect diversity. So there should be lots of bird food, uh, at least for a while. Uh, this is this is kind of hypothetical because nobody's measured it yet. I actually have a grad student who's thinking about doing that. 
disadvantages are that these plants will move through succession uh, and the more the the ones that grow fastest are going to start to outcompete the other ones. They will shade them out. And in 20 years, you're only going to have a few plants in that space. Um, so some people say, why don't you just plant those few plants uh, originally? And maybe they'll even grow a little, little faster. Uh, well, you have a lot of weeding, you've got a lot of mowing, you've got a, uh, and, and the plants you plant uh, are, are probably going to be more expensive. People always want big plants. Um, so, and you're move, you're losing all of these advantages when you, when you do that. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, when I first started thinking about this, I, I, I you know, I, I said, well, gee, in the end, it's only going to be a few plants. So why are we doing this? There are good reasons to do it. And now I'm, I'm actually a fan. Question 20. I often find the expense of purchasing native plants is out of my budgets. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, uh, try something uh, that we call addition by subtraction. It's actually, uh, the, the, I got that from Rick Dark. He suggests this all the time. So rather than actually planting our native plants, let them come in naturally. And all you worry about is removing the plants that you don't want. That's not trivial because these days with our invasive species, there's a lot of plants we don't want. But uh, are, are the animals around us, the things like uh, um, these little squirrels? <laughs> I'm having a brain brain freeze here. And of course, the gray squirrels, here's he's, he's moving a uh, uh, black walnut. Um, chipmunks, our, our blue jays, um, ants. There are a lot of things that are moving native plant seeds around, uh, and that's how they, they colonize. So if you simply remove the bad guys, here's a, a burning bush coming in, uh, especially at this stage. You've got to be vigilant. You can pull it out easily. Um, uh, then the plants that you leave, here's a, here's a burning bush that's not, not red. You've got to be careful. Uh, you can keep the bad guys out and let the, the good guys come in. You also can shift the uh, concentration, particularly of native grasses, towards the warm season bunch grasses by uh, changing your, your mowing schedule. This is what Larry Wiener suggests. If you mow heavily in the spring, uh, you're, you're keeping your cool season European grasses down and then don't mow the rest of the year for a couple of years in a row. That encourages the warm season bunch grasses that will come in and do well in the summertime and outcompete the, the uh, turf grass. So with those methods, you're actually shifting towards a, a higher uh, percentage of native plants without actually buying any plants at all. Question 21, I've been told that all animals are, or all annuals are weeds they have little value for, for wildlife and they should always be replaced by perennials. Is this true? No, it's not true. I don't know where that came from. Um, the notion that annuals are, are just placeholders for the more valuable perennials is I think it's preposterous. There's an awful lot of things to depend on our annuals, uh, like our honeybirds, depending honeybird, hummingbirds, depending on jewelweed. It's an extremely valuable resource for them uh, in, from August right through September. Um, then there's there's countless uh, specialist moths that are on our our uh, annuals. So things like the beautiful painted shinia is depends entirely on Indian blanket. Uh, the golden goldenrod hooded owlet uh, depends on horseweed. These are annuals. People don't like them, but those insects do. The goldenrod stowaway. It's a misnomer. It depends on Biden's aristosa, an, an annual. Um, it's a beautiful annual, actually. Uh, even even plants that we don't like uh, much, like like ragweed, support lots of things, like the common spraguia. It's a beautiful moth, um, the ragweed flower moth. We can call it ambrosia, and that makes it sound better. But annuals have a very important role in our ecosystems. They're colonizing earlier. Uh, they grow quickly, uh, and and um, they're step one in succession. So you certainly don't want to uh, get rid of them. Do you have a succinct statement to submit to my HOA who recently cited me for growing weeds? Well, let's try this. We humans face life-threatening crises from climate change and biodiversity loss. Reducing the area of lawn and using more productive native plants in our landscapes addresses both of these crises. This can be done tastefully without the use of chemicals and without reducing property values. It is the future of landscaping. Question 22, my HOA believes native plantings reduce property values. 
How can I convince them otherwise? Well, you can you can provide a good uh, model, a good example of why that's not going to happen. Uh, first of all, our, our native plants can be used in formal designs that aren't going to reduce property values. This is a design by Lynn O'Shaughnessy. You don't get more formal than that. Every plant in that landscape is uh, a native plant, and that's not going to reduce property values. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. Europeans love them, so we can too. Just tell that to your HOA. This is a uh, yard that is not being kept kept up, but every plant in this landscape is a non-native plant. This is Norway maple. Um, so, you know, it's a mess, but it's not, it's not a mess because of the species that are there. It's a mess because nobody's taking care of it. This is a 100% native plant, except for our little patch of, of uh, lawn here. This is Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. It's beautiful. Uh, an HOA would never cite her for this. They wouldn't know that they're, they're uh, native plants because they're beautiful. So using lawn as a cue for care, uh, as a good model to show that, yeah, we can use have more plants in our landscapes without it being wild and messy is the best way to convince your HOA that it's okay to use these natives. Question 23, I have a small property. Should I plant several individuals of a few species or should I try to squeeze as much diversity onto the property as possible, but only have one or two individuals of each species? That is a really good question. And it depends on what you're trying to, to plant these natives for. What, what are you, what's this restoration uh, directed at? Let's say we want to support the monarch. Well, having one or two individuals of milkweed is, is not the way to go if you're trying to support a monarch because uh, just two or three caterpillars will strip these plants uh, and it won't be enough resource for them. So having a big patch like this will be enough for all the monarchs uh, that, that you're ever going to have. That's bunching. That's, that's uh, you know, massing that's required to support that particular target insect. What if you're trying to support pollinators? Here's Black-Eyed Susan. Let's say you're a specialist pollinator on Black-Eyed Susan. You want to make it as convenient as possible. Uh, so the, the, the bee has you know doesn't have to go far to to move from flower to flower foraging can be really efficient uh, and it can reproduce quickly if it had to fly 200 yards between each plant uh, to find one uh, it would be much more difficult to get the resources that it that it needs so on a small property it's probably better to to aggregate a few species um, use use higher numbers, higher abundance of a few species, then get a few individuals of many species. But this is where you can you can form a neighborhood uh, group where you're targeting a lot of different species, but you're going to use a lot more properties to do it. Um, you're seeking diversity through your neighbors, and you can also build community doing that. Question 24, why do you want us to keep our leaves on our property? Oh, there's so many reasons. Like leaves protect the soil moisture of our, our soil community. They're returning nutrients to the soil uh, and they're providing habitat. Those are three good ones. Uh, remember, there are more species that live in the soil than above the soil. It's an extremely um, a diverse ecosystem. Uh, and most of the species are detritivores. They are breaking down the leaf litter, returning the nutrients to the soil so that the tree can use them again the next year. If you look at a square meter of, of healthy leaf litter, there are probably 250,000 mites, 100,000 springtails, 90,000 proturans. Those are immature, uh, not immature, um, very primitive insects. Uh, really takes a microscope to see them well. A million nematodes. It is a thriving ecosystem, and all of that is in that leaf litter. And when you rake it away, none of that is in that leaf litter. There are beautiful butterflies that depend on leaf litter, like the banded hair streak. Its caterpillars eat oak leaf litter. There could be a caterpillar down there. You would never see it when you're raking away and you lose that beautiful species and several other Lycaenids as well. There are 70 species of moths that we call litter, litter moths, like the ambiguous litter moth or the American idea or the dark spotted palthus. They're all living in leaf litter unless we rake it away. And then you've got the predators that eat all of those things. Uh, never, several species of ground beetles. How about the fireflies? This is an adult firefly. It's not a fly at all. It's a beetle. That's not a bug either. If we call it a lightning bug, there's its luminescent organ. But this is what the larva looks like. 
It is a predator in leaf litter where it's eating arthropods, worms, and, and uh, snails and slugs. If we rake away the leaf litter, we lose our fireflies. And of course, there's many birds uh, like, like our flickers here that are depending on all of that life that is in the leaf litter under our trees. So those are the reasons that I, I try to keep encourage people to keep leaf litter on the property. Where should you do it? You want to put it uh, under the trees as, as much as you can. Uh, so this is just a, a neighbor. Most of them, a lot of these plants are not native plants, but he's got the idea of having beds around his trees. The bigger the bed, the better. Uh, and that is where your leaves should go. I did a homestay um, somewhere. I don't remember where I was, but uh, I took this picture because these people simply put a, a little rock divider here and they put a lot of leaves in, in here. Uh, it's one way of keeping leaves in a fairly neat way in your, your yard but won't the leaves bury my plants? Well, you know, when I hear that, I always wonder who was raking the leaves before we got here. Uh, and we did have plants. So somehow those plants must be able to get through normal leaf litter. This is trout lily coming right through the leaf litter. No problem at all. Nobody raked it. This is uh, at my house. This is wood poppy uh, coming through the leaf litter. I don't rake my leaf litter for two reasons. I'm not home to do it. And I want it to stay where it is. Uh, so this is what it looks like in the spring. It's just starting. Uh, and here it is a few weeks later, coming right through the, the leaf litter, no problem at all. Um, these, you know, these wonderful spring ephemeral beds that you see at places like Map Cuba Center, um, there's there's a leaf litter base in, in all of these things. Here's Virginia creeper uh, with a leaf litter base acting as a ground cover, it just goes right over it. Golden seal right over it. Put in your your uh, wild ginger and your may apples and your foam flower and your ferns all over a base of leaf litter, uh, which is then being de de decomposed by all those insects we mentioned. Uh, this is a wonderful way to support your tree. It will love it. And also all the moths that fall out of that tree can pupate very nicely into in this, this setting. Uh, here's a layered landscape. It doesn't, you know, all ground covers don't have to be two inches high. All of these can be considered a ground cover. And again, the leaf litter is right down there. Can I mulch my leaves? Well, you can, uh, but what you're doing is mulching all those insects I just talked about too, including your fireflies. You're grinding them all up. Uh, so the, the real question is, why do you need to, to mulch it? You do not need to mulch your leaves. It will shorten their functional lifespan uh, you never want to have bare soil. So if mulching your leaves leaves the soil bare by the end of August, not a good idea. People do it because it looks nicer, I know. But um, I don't know. We've got to put functionality before aesthetics one of these days. Question 28, do cultivars of native plants have the same ecological value as their parent species? Well, it depends on the trait that, that was selected for. Um, so this is a common question. We looked at six, six traits, ones that in uh, woody plants, ones that enhance fall color and leaf variegation, change of growth habit, disease resistance, enhanced fruiting, changing a, a green leaf to red or purple. The only one that had uh, a, a uh, impact on insects was changing a green leaf to red or purple because that loads the leaf with uh, anthocyanins, which are feeding deterrents. Uh, so, and I know we love our, our red leaf uh, cultivars, but uh, I would suggest uh, avoiding them. You know, double double flowers, of course, remove all of the uh, benefits for pollinators. You're taking the the anthers and and uh, all the reproductive parts of the, the flowers, and it ends up turning them into petals, and then you end up having no uh, nectar and no um, no pollen for our pollinators. Uh, Mount Cuba Center, I mentioned this a couple of times in this talk, they're doing a number of, of very nice comparisons um, in trial gardens. Uh, so I would go to go to this website, go to their, their website and look at their results because they're very good at posting them. They've tested a lot of, of uh, perennial plants in terms of whether they're good or bad as cultivars. Okay, question 29. This is our last question. Um, and I've debated whether or not to include it, but I'm going to include it this time. I know this is very personal, but I'm dying to know what your religious views are. Uh, well, first, let's talk about my, my religious history. I was baptized a Presbyterian. I was raised as a Methodist. My first marriage was into a Greek Orthodox family. My second marriage to Cindy was in a Quaker meeting house. So I've kind of been around the religious block at this point. 
Uh, I think about it all the time and my views are always changing. But let me first talk, talk about what I don't believe in. I do not believe that every species on earth was put here for humans to exploit. I do not believe it is God's will to destroy the world as we know it and to use humans as his agents of destruction. I do not believe he's pleased when we cut down 2,000 year old wood, redwoods so we can make frivolous lawn furniture. And I do not believe that that when we level a boreal forest to make magazine inserts or toilet paper, that he's very pleased. Or when we shoot the most numerous bird in the planet to oblivion for fun. I'm talking about the passenger pigeon. What do I believe? Well, I'm starting to see an awful lot of similarities between today's major religions and the beliefs of the ancients that we, we came from. Um, and here are some of them. God created man and beast and all the fishes in the sea. Uh, that's a common theme. God laid down a number of basic rules, commandments that we have to follow to remain in his good graces. God is forgiving when we seek forgiveness. So what if we deified nature the way the ancients did? Uh, let's call her Mother Nature and look at each one of these, these uh, conditions that our, our modern religions have. Did Mother Nature create humans? Are there rules we must follow to remain in nature's good graces? Does nature promise eternal life for believers? Well, scientists long ago reached the consensus that, yes, humans are products of natural selection. They're a product of nature. So, yes, Mother Nature created humans. Are there basic rules we have to follow to remain in Mother Nature's good graces? Absolutely. If we overexploit the ecosystems that provide our life support, in other words, the, the products from nature that we call ecosystem services, those ecosystems are going to collapse and we're going to lose those services. If we harvest fish faster than those fish can reproduce, the fisheries collapse. And we're talking about the Atlantic cod, Alaska's halibut snow crab, and red, red king crabs, Pacific salmon, orange ruffy. So many times we've overfished our fisheries. When we shoot all the passenger pigeons and the dodos and the stellar sea cows and the great ox and the Alaskan curlews and the Carolina parakeets, American bison and others, those creatures either go extinct or they become functionally extinct and we no longer uh, get meat from them. If we kill off our pollinators, we lose pollinator services. If we chop down the air's forest, we lose the lungs and climate control of the planet. If we pollute our atmosphere with carbon dioxide, we suffer the ravages of climate change. If we pave over our watersheds, we get washed away in floods. If we remove water from our aquifers and rivers faster than it can be replaced by rain, our rivers no longer reach the sea. The Great Salt Lake becomes a mud flag. The Aral Sea dries up entirely. That's what you're looking at here. And our aquifers provide sand instead of water. It's nature who's in control on this planet. We are not. And if we don't play by her rules, she's going to smite us, as it were. So the ancients understood all this, and they lived the best they, they could within the constraints of Mother Nature. And when they didn't, their societies collapsed. What about the promise of eternal life for believers? Well, our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids, our cousins, our nieces, our nephews, they're all carrying our genes forward into future generations. And as long as our lineage respects the laws of nature, uh, we get to reproduce, reproduce those genes uh, well into the future. Is nature forgiving? Nature's enormously forgiving. It's resilient. This used to be a cornfield. This is the Natchusa grasslands in Illinois. 750 species of plants there, 180 bird species living there. Didn't take long to recover from a, a, a cornfield. So nature is forgiving, but it's not endlessly forgiving. There are limits to her ability to rebuild ecosystems. And the easiest limit to understand is extinction. Mother Nature is not going to forgive us for condemning one or more of her creations to extinction. It and its contributions to our life support are lost forever. Keep this in mind when you remember that the UN is predicting we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. So what do I believe? I believe the ancients had it right. I really do. What sustains us day to day is the natural world right here on earth. The ancients' beliefs did not come about by accidents. They were products of natural selection. Those who treated the natural systems that supported them with care and respect thrived. Those who overexploited them for short-term personal gain did not. So whether or not we deify nature today, I believe we need to show her reverence as if we did. That's all I have. Thanks very much. 
Great. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. The first one is, are there any oaks that aren't susceptible to the things that are killing oaks? Yes. In every species of oak, there are resistant individuals. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, that is, that's good news. So that includes sudden oak death syndrome, all of the, the really nasty guys, they're killing a good percentage of our oaks, but there's, there's, uh, some percentage and sometimes, you know, it's 20% or more that have good resistance. Those are going to be the future of our oak forests. Uh, and, and the blue jays are helping us in that regard because, when they move acorns around, they pick them up and, and weigh them. So first of all, the really sick trees don't make any acorns, but the ones that are, are not quite as healthy, they make small and light acorns. The jays pick up the heaviest ones and take them away. So that what they're doing is propagating, and then they, they tap them below the soil surface. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So they're actually planting resistant uh, uh, genotypes that will carry forth into the future. The next question is, what about the moths who love kale? Ah, uh, the moths that love kale. I think it's it's called the green stripe something. Yeah, aren't they cute? Uh, <laughs> what about them? Well, you know, we 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 are competing with uh, the things that eat our our agricultural products because we want them. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying we're not, shouldn't have any, any agriculture. You've got to control them in the best way you, you can. But uh, for the most part, there are biggest agricultural pests, uh, things like uh, the cabbage white butterfly are introduced pests themselves. They, they're, they're invasive species that don't have a lot of natural enemies. Uh, but yeah, there's a conflict. And that's, of course, why we have uh, um, insecticides. It's why the whole field of entomology was created, was to fight insect pests in agriculture. And that was our last question. Oh, okay, good. Because I didn't know how to answer it. <laughs> oh, no, one more. Once something else just popped up. Excellent webinar. You were able to give a lot of information in bite-sized, easy to understand pieces. So thank you for that. I didn't realize the black and orange insects were coded to tell the world they taste bad. Who are their predators? Well, nothing eats them. <laughs> but if they were green, uh, it would be mostly birds. Birds love green hairless caterpillars, things in the family geometridae. That's their favorite food. Actually, I shouldn't say that. There are a ton of insect predators that uh, eat other insects, uh, and they're doing it all the time. Hymenopteran predators and assassin bugs and predatory stink bugs and so on. Okay, so, thank you. Oh, we had another one just pop up. What would be some good pollinator plants for a pollinator strip? It depends on where you live, but um, the best way to create a pollinator garden is to focus on the plants that support specialist pollinators. So we have almost 4,000 species of native bees. A third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. So if we plant those plants, the generalist bees can use those plants as well. So in the east, particularly the northeast, uh, Massachusetts, for example, goldenrod would be probably the best plant you could put in. It supports about 12 species of specialist bees, followed by uh, native asters, supports 11 species, something like that. Our... our uh, Perennial sunflowers, anything in the genus Helianthus is very high in terms of, of specialist bees. If you have those three genera in your, your yard, you can support up to 40 species of, of specialist bees. And the generalist bees, like our honeybees and our bumblebees uh, and many other native bees, can use those plants as well. All right. I think, oh, another one just popped up. I live on the ocean. Which pollinators can I support best and with which plants? Uh, you should use seaside goldenrod. It's, I think it's the prettiest of our goldenrods uh, and it's adapted to, to high salt uh, and, and it does really well. So that's a great one. You know, monarchs migrate right down the coast. So those fall blooming asters are really important to, to fuel that monarch migration uh, uh, that's, you know, happens, start from late August on, on down. Um, Baccarus, you know, the, uh, I forget its common name, uh, but it's a it's a, a shrub 
uh, that does well. And of course, our, our uh, myrtles, wax myrtle uh, is, is another great plant. All of these things are flowering plants and they're helping pollinators. You do not need big showy flowers to help pollinators. American holly is a, an important plant, particularly in our coastal plain areas uh, along the shore. Their flowers are tiny little yellow things, but they're magnets for native bees. Um, they're all over them when they're in bloom, even though they're not very pretty for us. Um, and then another one just popped up. What kind of asters? Um, oh, you know, New York aster, New England aster. Uh, those are two that are popping in into mine. Okay, great. Um, I think we've come to the end of our questions. You're getting lots of hearts floating I up the screen, you see. Yeah. Yes, so thank you very much. That was very informative. All right, and well, thanks, thanks. Good luck, yeah. everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. So thank you, everyone.